Election season is officially over. No major change-ups in San Diego's congressional delegation, but the House of Representatives certainly looks much different than last term. This is Politically Speaking. <laughs> From NBC7 News, this is Politically Speaking. Thanks for joining me on Politically Speaking. I'm your host, Priya Shreether. We're coming to you this week from Balboa Park. Well, the Republicans took the majority in the House of Representatives, but not by the margins that many were expecting. The first test of the party in power was the speakership vote, which many analysts say indicated just how fractured the Republican Party really is. I got a chance to sit down with Republican Congressman Daryl Issa from the newly redrawn 48th District to talk about his priorities and what he thinks he can accomplish this term now that his party Party is in power. You're entering this new term and your party is in the majority in the House. Um, tell me about how you think things are going to be different from last term and what are your top priorities? Well, you know, we want to make sure that we begin working on the problems that have been around for a while but need to be solved. Uh, one of them, obviously, are the, is the root cause of inflation, which includes a lot of overspending. Uh, another one, though, candidly, is that uh, we've been ignoring failures by this administration to enforce the law as they should. And here in San Diego, as we see a completely wide open border, we see uh, now it's over 5 million people who have been paroled into this country. Uh, over 95 percent of them have no merit to their claims, uh, and yet they're here. So my committee, the Judiciary Committee, is going to deal with that. But we also have, we have an epidemic of litigation, mostly over patents, uh, that are tying up our courts and stifling real innovation. So there are other issues that are less partisan that uh, hopefully I can provide leadership with Democrats uh, at the same time on. And I never really got to ask you about what you made of that first week, you know, before you were able to swear in. There was obviously 15 votes there, you know, some record breaking stuff happening there. What was I mean, being there on the floor and voting 15 times, what was going through your head during all that? Well, I think I told people before and I'll tell them again now, we knew it was inevitable that uh, Kevin McCarthy would be our speaker. Uh, Ninety percent of the conference supported him and wanted him. There was nobody else that had 80 or 70 or 60 or 50 percent of the conference believing that they should be our leader and our speaker. Uh, and by the way, that includes Steve Scalise and the rest of the leadership. They were supporting him. So we knew there was a process. We knew we'd have to go through it. We went through it. Uh, the world got to see democracy work. They also got to see, as the number whittled down, that there really was just a small handful who were dedicated to not vote yes, no matter what. Uh, as it turned out, it was down to six. And are you worried about any of the concessions that McCarthy made to that small handful to get those numbers whittled down as he did? You know, uh, the so-called concessions are pretty much openness, transparency, uh, bills having at least 72 hours for people to read them before they come to the floor. Uh, each of these rule changes makes a lot of sense. Uh, the fact that one person can bring up uh, a vote to, uh, quote, vacate the chair, to ask the speaker to step down, uh, I hope it's not abused, because whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, if you don't have 51 percent wanting to get rid of the speaker, there's really no point in making that motion. So uh, when that rule was in place, from 1910 until Nancy Pelosi became speaker, we lived under it without an abuse of it. So hopefully uh, now it's back. We'll, uh, we'll rightfully so uh, not see it used unless it's appropriate. And given the fact that you guys do have the majority, but you know, only by a small margin, are you worried that that 10 percent that you know, wasn't on board with McCarthy initially might derail some of the big plans and, and things that you guys want to get done this term? You know, that's a great question, and I, I think I'll, I'll tell you the first one, and it's going to be one that everyone will see in the light of day. Uh, Nancy Pelosi spent $1.7 trillion without a Republican vote uh, just before leaving office and did not raise the debt ceiling. Today, January 19th, uh, we were just informed by uh, Janet Yellen that we'd hit uh, the, uh, the debt ceiling, that we, in fact, are 
out of uh, authority to borrow. So if that's the case, then uh, the fact is only 17 or 16 days after she left office, we've hit that level. We're going to have to vote to raise the debt ceiling. It will not be done with Republican votes only. It isn't our bill. It's a bill written, uh, an expense written by the other party. So will some Republicans help cover the, the, uh, the cost of this uh, check that's already been written? Yes. But the challenge is really going to be, will the Democrats step up and, in, and uniformly vote to raise the debt ceiling to cover the money that they spent when they were in the majority? If they do, they'll only need four or five Republicans. If they don't, and we will have a challenge in the weeks and months to come. So you're saying that you're going to need Democrats to get on board, even no, just with not, not just the de debt ceiling issue, but with. Well, I'm, I'm sp speaking specifically about the debt okay. ceiling. They wrote the check. The check now is being cashed and we're out of money. So uh, I will expect uh, now uh, Hakeem uh, to uh, th their minority leader to bring virtually every one of their votes to bear uh, if they want to raise the debt ceiling. If they don't, then it will be Nancy Pelosi's legacy that uh, the government defaulted. I don't want that to happen. Uh, I believe that if you write the check, you cover it when it shows up at the bank. But I think it's important that people understand whether we have a four seat or a 14 seat or even a 40 seat majority, it's really uh, a bipartisan responsibility, primarily in the hands of the party that spent the money. And uh, that's for Joe Biden and uh, Hakeem Jeffries and others to raise most of those votes. And on other issues, though, are you worried about getting a consensus within the Republican Party, just given the fact that there are some people who seem to be willing to kind of do their own thing? Well, uh, you know, we're not exactly a perfect team, team sport. But I think it's important to understand the people that voted no are among our most conservative uh, people. The last to come on board for uh, Speaker McCarthy were among our most conservative. Uh, so on most issues, those individuals will be people who want more cuts to government, who want more austerity, who want less of the bloated government that we've been having. Uh, and uh, so I'm not worried about their support. They're supporting the initiatives that go the way I want them to go. Uh, I am concerned that uh, we'll get their vote, uh, but we may lose votes among our most moderate members. And so, you know, with this four seat majority, we're not doing it alone. But let me just make one thing clear. It doesn't matter if the House has all the votes it needs without any Democrats. The Senate has a majority of Democrats and needs 60 votes. So there is no partisan only in the Senate. There is no partisan only in the House effectively. Straight ahead on Politically Speaking, there's a new sheriff in town and he has a lot to deal with from unprecedented staffing shortages to overdoses to jail dads. I talked to her one on one to find out how she plans to tackle all of it. And later, now that the dust has settled on the 2022 midterms, what are some of the big takeaways at the local level? I spoke to an analyst who breaks down the numbers of how the Republicans and Democrats did here in San Diego.